Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Rebecca Rush. This is my coach, Tim Cusick. Welcome to Giddy Up For Good, our final instructional webinar before the Giddy Up Challenge this weekend. It's just, what, four days away? I'm kind of freaking out. I don't know if you guys are too. Um, but the goal of all of these webinars is to really help you feel um, as confident as possible and prepared um, for the big weekend ahead. And I have to say thanks to all of you who have signed up so far. I think we have over 400 riders and runners this weekend, and we've already raised over $30,000 um, for COVID relief through the Be Good Foundation. Our goal is 50. Um, we're going to get there. Um, but it's really exciting to see the energy that has been kind of created around this. And um, you guys have motivated me. So thank you. That was my, my number one goal is to motivate me. Um, and the second goal was to motivate the community. And third, to do something good about this, um, something proactive about this situation we're all in. And so thank you for being part of that. Um, I'm really nervous for the weekend, but I'm really excited. And my uh, sort of gauge of when a challenge is is a really good one is if it makes my hands sweat when I think about it. And my hands are sweating right now <laughs> because I'm kind of nervous um, for what I signed up for. But that's a good thing. That means it's going to be hard. It means you're pushing outside your element. And um, and it's going to be an amazing weekend. So you guys know if you missed any of the original webinars, those are all on the website um, and on YouTube for preparing, organizing. But we're down to the final day. So this third webinar is really about execution. You've done the work. You've done the prep. And now we're just going to kind of put the icing on the cake and make sure that you're really dialed. So we're going to go through aid station, nutrition, motivation, and just some final details. And then, of course, at the end, take your questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tim. Yeah, and obviously one of the things that we have been doing throughout this series and want to continue to do today is just that. Take all of your questions. I know as a coach, uh, it, you know, not having your questions answered or worrying about things going into an event can actually significantly increase your anxiety and your stress which doesn't always relate to good performance. So today is your last opportunity to ask the good questions here, and we'd be glad to help you uh, prepare and get ready to execute for success. To ask a question, all you need to do is open this little UI here. There's a little orange arrow. It's typically on the right-hand side of your screen. Scroll through your options to you see the questions bar, and you can type your questions in here. Um, I am watching them on a screen up here, already seeing some people saying hello. Hi, Kate. Um, the uh, ask your questions, enter as you go. They're lining up on a list above me. So sometimes if I'm looking up, it's not that I'm not looking at my screen, I'm looking at questions on the screen behind. Um, and then when we get to the end, we'll answer them. If something's really pertinent for the moment, I might interrupt uh, Rebecca or myself and just say, hey, let's answer this question because it's a great one. So feel free, pile them in there. We'll answer them all in the end. All right. What's up first? Okay, so this is the Stoke section, so that's me. Um, I think that what I want to talk about first is um, your why and why you signed up for this challenge. I told you a little bit about why I launched it um, for myself to connect our community and also do something proactive um, about COVID relief. And, and that's all going through the Be Good Foundation. And just so you guys know that the mission statement of the Be Good Foundation is to use the bike as a catalyst for healing, empowerment, and evolution. And that happens personally within you um, for your ride this weekend, but it's also uh, expands a lot further than just beyond what you're individually doing this weekend. Um, I think what's really cool when I when I think about you know personal evolution, people always ask me why I go do these suffer fests, why I torture myself. And it's not just because it isn't at all that I like the feeling of pain. I know that's my nickname, the queen of pain. Um, and I really had, you know, I had Rich Roll, I did a podcast a while ago and he asked me, what is your relationship with pain? And I'd never really answered the question very well, but I've been able to now articulate that these really hard, arduous events um, pain becomes my teacher. 
And it's the place where when I'm physically working super hard, um, I really find out what I'm made of and who I am. And there's, you may think that, you know, why does it matter if I do a race, I do a challenge or I do an event, you know, what's the big deal? I'm getting fitter. That's awesome. But I really, I really believe strongly that a mastery of, of craft, whether it's cycling or running or, or anything you do, the mastery of the craft, it's not just about the craft itself. It's really about the mastery of yourself and what you're learning along the trail and what you're going to experience this weekend is going to be your personal evolution and growth. But the beautiful thing that's happening that I talked about a little bit, it's expanding beyond you as well. By you becoming a stronger, more confident, better person, you're instantly going to spread that to your community. And our cycling community and our ride community is already seeing it right now. All the social media and the people jumping in and people getting on board here, it's its a real excitement and an energy that has, has brought us together. And and so we are empowering each other, even though we're connecting in a digital format and we're riding, we're riding, you know, technically alone, but really together this weekend. Um, and it's connecting us all. And that's important. And then the third thing about the why for me is that we really are having an effect on global healing. And you may think that your little ride up and down a bunch of hills might not mean that much, um, but it means everything. The fact that we've already raised $30,000 for COVID relief and um, is really big. You know, a bunch of people getting together over the weekend to do something hard is really making an impact globally. And that's why I started the Be Good Foundation was to to use my bike. And my personal mission statement is to continually inspire myself and others to be good. And so while you're out there riding this weekend, you're going to have plenty of time to think about it. Um, I want you to think about your why, and especially in the moments where you're hating it, you're suffering, you don't want to go up that hill another time, um, take yourself out of your body and, and expand it to your, your cycling com community, your family, your small group community, and also globally, knowing that, that the work that you're doing this weekend is actually really making a difference, not just for you personally, but, but for all of us. And so... There's going to be some moments where you are hating it and you want to turn around and you want to go home. Um, and that's really where you are going to have to ask yourself your why. Um, you can write it on your top tube. You can sharpie it on your, in on your arm. Or if you don't know yet your personal mission statement or your why for for what you're doing this weekend, um, you're going to have a lot of time to think about it. So maybe, uh, maybe that's um, some soul searching time. And I really do find in these long events, I spend a lot of time um, with music off and just in my head and and really meditating and so you're gonna have the opportunity to do that and, and really figure out your why the second part i want to talk about is your how and i really want to emphasize number one we're doing amazing things in the world this weekend um, but number one i want you to do it safely i want you to look after your personal safety the safety of your community you know wherever you are um, whatever your covid regulations are please adhere to those um and you know stay at a safe distance i know for me on trail creek there's going to be i know at least a handful of people that are also using that same climb which is really exciting it's going to be motivating for me to wave at them as we're going up and down um, but just please remember you set an example for people around you um and the last thing i want is for anyone to get hurt or be unsafe or send a message that we're not being conscious i mean ultimately our goal is to raise money for covid relief so please remember that while you're out there and adhere to those those regulations of your area um and you know i also i have some shark ethics that are pretty easy um they're the the ethics that i invented with a first grade friend of mine um for rebecca's private idaho and the the word shark they just stand for a few few guidelines so if you're ever in doubt the number one is s for safety h for honesty a for accountability r for responsible and k for kind so if you're ever in doubt, you can go to the shark rules and be like, is this safe? 
Is this honest? Am I being accountable? It's pretty easy. If a first grader can do it, I figure we can. Um, and then the, the last safety thing to think about with your how is to really look at the weather and the elements. I know for me, I live in the mountains. It snowed today. I really hope it doesn't rain and snow on Saturday. Um, I plan to stop, start Saturday morning, but I also have a contingency plan to start Sunday morning if the weather's really lousy. And so please take into consideration that and alter your plans. You have three days, you know, to choose your start time. Um, and think about, especially if you're doing one of the longer challenges, if you're gonna be riding at night, um, take that into accommodation, you're gonna be tired. Um, the ultimate goal is that you all complete this dead tired, but really safe and fine and not, not dead, just dead tired. Um, and, you know, if it does get to a situation where you have to pull the plug, then go back to your why. Why did you wanna do this ride? Um, and if you, if you happen to fail in your attempt, you haven't failed, um, because we're doing amazing things. And I think, uh, Tim says it best when we do our workouts, he's like, it's not, okay. you can fail, but it's not okay to quit. Okay. So if you get to a situation where, where it really is safer for you to pull the plug then go for it and don't beat yourself up about it. Um, but we're not allowed to quit. We're allowed to fail. I like that quote from you, Tim. That's a good one. It's on my line. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna go down to the aid station. I'm, I went back into the archives for this a little bit. This is um, Kyrgyzstan Adventure Racing World Championships and our aid stations there were actually yurts. It was really cool. Um, but that you can see that big box of stuff and that blowout of equipment. Um, that's where I really learned how to do aid stations well was adventure racing. So this plastic crate would be transported around the world. We'd get to our crate, open it up, and inside is all the hyper-organized gear that we might need. And this is where I started labeling all my stuff, putting things in color-coded bags, because you open a big black bin if it's all full of, of black stuff sacks. Um, that doesn't work. So I would put, you know, socks and hats go in a yellow bag, um, food goes in a green bag. And I had it really kind of segmented out like that. You're going to have your car or a tent or, you know, your house if you're inside. But I really would encourage you to get um, really kind of over the top with the organization because when you get really tired, you get really stupid, you get really fumbly, and you get frustrated if you can't find something. And there's nothing worse than digging through a bag of black, you know, items for your arm warmers and you can't find them. And so I really, really organize my equipment that way. Um, and, and, and it pays off, you know, if you can be organized on the front end, you're going to be really happy about it later. So I break, I'll break my car and my little tent area into kind of zones. One's going to be food and nutrition. And I've already started, I'm going to fill, I think I'm going to take about 20 hours. So I'm going to pre-fill 20 water bottles with the mix in them, with everything ready to go. Um, I'm also going to have extras of everything. And so I'm going to have a big jug of Roctane drink that if I use and plain water. So if I use all my water bottles that were pre-mixed or I don't want to drink that, I've got options. So I'm going to have my A plan and my B and C plan. Um, so yeah, I'm going to pre-fill all my food per hour, all segmented out so I can just grab and go. Um, but then I'm going to have the backup of the nutrition that is going to be rice cakes and pizza and whatever else and plain water um, in case I don't feel like it, Red Bull, all that kind of stuff. So um, A plan in the front and then B plan behind it and C plan of like, oh, if you know my stomach goes bad or you know I'm just not able to eat the food that I normally eat. So foods in one section, um, bike equipment and maintenance is in, the, is in another section. Again, I label little Ziploc bags that are like, you know, extra, extra, you know, tube or flat tire changing. I'll have a second saddlebag that's just ready to go. So if I've had to fix a flat, I can just take one bag off, grab a new bag and put it on instead of having to fumble through all the equipment. And since it's a running clock, you know, this is basically from 24 hour and uh, solos and adventure racing days. Since the clock is running, you may think, oh, that just takes 30 seconds or that just takes a minute to fill a water bottle. But you add up a minute over 20 hours 
you know, and that's 20 minutes, obviously. Um, I'm really good at math, you can tell. <laughs> and you do that two more times or you're like, oh, that was, I just sat down for five minutes, you know, and you, you add all that up and suddenly you're looking at two, three, four hours um, into your schedule. So I would rather save time and pre-fill water bottles and things like that. So that allows me more rest time to actually sit down or take a breather or change a flat. And so any of that preloading that you can do, um, you should definitely do. So food, bike equipment, clothing. Again, I segment my clothing out by what it is. Um, I try to choose brightly colored things so that everything is not black um, or put it in little separate bags so that, so that you know what things are. Bring doubles, triples of everything in case the weather's bad, in case it rains, in case you drop your jacket, you lose it you get a hole in it, whatever it is. I'm gonna take probably enough clothes for three people, um, just in case. I'm taking a down jacket even, in case I'm freezing at the top of the climb and I wanna put on a puffy coat. Um, temperatures here are 35 at night. So I'm really planning for you know between 70 and 35 Fahrenheit is what I'm looking at. Um, technology, same, I'll have a separate bundle that's technology. It's all labeled, there's extra batteries. I'm bringing, um, three different bike lights, just in case, you know, um, and also so I don't have to recharge, I can just swap one out. I'm gonna have a second helmet that's already loaded with my night light on it. So I can just take my helmet off and put it on instead of strapping the light all on. So I think you guys are getting the idea. Um, and then you also want some comfort stuff. I'm gonna throw a sleeping bag um, in my car and a chair and some stuff in case I'm really not feeling well or something's happening and I need to lie down for 20 minutes. Um, I'm gonna bring some real, real comfy stuff as well. Um, and then on my body though, on my, on my climbs, the beauty of having an aid station is that you can go really light on your climbs and descents. The only things I'm gonna carry are trail maintenance, you know, for a flat fixing, um, my food and calories just for that one lap. My laps are about an hour. So I'm planning a body, a water bottle and about 200 to 300 calories per hour. Um, and then warm, warm clothes for the descent, super key. Don't get too cold on the descent. Um, and we all know if you're shivering and you're tight and you're tense, one, it's, it's, it's not a safe descending, but you're also burning calories by shivering. And so you don't want to have to burn any extra calories. And then of course my Garmin, I'm going to be hyper aware of that because I want to record this bad boy and I want to make sure I get credit for this. So I'm going to keep my eyes on my Garmin battery. I'm going to have a little battery um, backup just in case. So that's all the stuff I'll have with me um, on the bike. So you know, station go heavy on the bike, go light. Anything you know, to add? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Yeah. You know, you made a really good point that it's so funny as a coach that I always stress this type of thinking. Like if I told everybody on this webinar right now, I could save you an hour in your challenge if you were Everesting, right? Or half an hour if you're 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 doing something less. You'd be like, oh, hey coach, yeah, teach me, get me in better shape, do that. One of the ways you can often save 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes in this type of a challenge is to be as organized and as well laid out as Rebecca just said. You guys, it's free time right? It really is. It's free speed. It's free pace. No matter however you want to look at it, it's going to help you achieve your challenge. You don't want to create a time, you know, or a situation where you're wasting time, but the more you organize those elements, simply put, the faster you're going to go through your challenge. So if I said it was a training exercise, people would say, oh, I have to do that kind of training or those intervals. But I see a lot of times the athlete doesn't take as much time to be as prepared as Rebecca does. And, you know, if you were racing her head to head, she'd put an hour into your time with just her better prep. So it's a great idea, great thought process for you to be well prepared. So great tips. Well, then you, you can ride more conservatively. If you, I'd rather make up time that's easy yeah. to make up instead of pedaling <laughs> harder, um, just get organized harder. And then, and then you don't have to pedal as hard. Agreed. So speaking of pedaling as hard, Let's do a little execution planning that's going to focus more a little bit on the challenge and, and, and more specifically the fueling and nutrition kind of elements. Earlier in webinar one and again in webinar two, we talked about kind of dicing and slicing our challenge, how we're going to put it together as laps and micro segments. Well, now that we have that right, we've actually went in and we used the uh, Everest 
planner or the Eversting planner. I have a link to it at the end here on the last slide, which we can share the link. And the slide, you can download this presentation right out of that same right-hand little section under uh, handouts. It'll say handouts one of five. You can download it right there. So we ran Rebecca's number and we learned some really cool stuff and we ended up with one interesting challenge. So right off the bat, one of the things, even before we ran the numbers that, you know, kind of I did is we knew what her challenge was. We went and found the segment that she decided to climb. Garmin told us, I'm sorry, Garmin Strava told us it was 4.1 miles, 1,429 feet. I've also, now that we've gotten closer, I'm watching the weather every day because it's actually not only going to impact um, her overall, I mean, it impacts her overall performance, but it's going to have elements of our planning. It's going to potentially affect our planning, how we, we might pace ourselves in colder rain versus drier sun might not be the same. And it gives us insight, as she said, it gets pretty cold overnight there. We're looking at temperatures you know, in the, I called Sunday's weather here now that I see it, but Saturday's, um, you know, about 35 degrees. Um, the reality is, so we know the environment, we've picked our segment, we understand what challenge, we know the environment. We then run the calculator. So we're gonna use the automated version first. So basically you it simply can enter the segment URL and it'll calculate it out for you. It has some pretty easy sliders. So you could estimate your climb speed and your descent speed and some rest stops. So what I did with Rebecca here is we uh, added the URL. We find our uh, Trail Creek climb, matching our Trail Creek climb. It basically tells us we need 18.4 laps at a total distance of 8.3 laps per, which would get her 153 miles for the 24 hours. So. How do we then predict how long it will take? You can simply estimate your climbing speed and your descending speed. A great way to do this, right? I talked about using 150% of your uh, best time. You can simply look through your past times, whether you use Strava or you're recording data in Training Peaks or some other function. Look at your past times and the speed that you went up at that stage and simply just rough out the math. The beauty of sliders is you can kind of begin to figure it out, right? So for Rebecca, we want to pace it. Her strength and her physiological capabilities are more about all day pacing than maybe putting in some explosive climbs and trying to get in some, you know, really ahead early. So we're looking at an average climb speed of about six miles an hour on the climb, considering she's going up a, uh, six and a half percent, seven percent grade with some, you know, obviously some tougher segments on gravel. That's pretty solid, not super fast, but certainly not something we would consider slow. Um, descending is where she's going to be descending on gravel in sometimes in the day and sometimes at night, right? So think about these average speeds. Try to think about them as your average over 24 hours, right? So she's going to probably do some of her faster climbs a little faster than six miles an hour, not too much faster. We don't want to pop her, but I bet you she'll be a little faster. And then later, she might be at that or it may be even a little slower, right? The descending becomes the same reality. So as you're descending on, particularly doing it on a, a, a gravel road, right, and a gravel bike, you have to descend a little more cautiously. You're not going to be able to kind of just let it rip, like maybe a nice clean road descent. Um, you have a lot of loose stone, you have uh, rain and ruts, you have chatter, which is actually also going to impact fatigue, which we'll talk about in the next slide. So we wanted to make sure that we went slow enough in the downhill because we don't want to make the downhill end up being work, meaning at no given time, like we could say, wow, Rebecca could do that at 20 miles an hour full bore, but then she's going to be working downhill both physically turning some pedals, more pedals than we want, doing some work, and probably mentally, right? When you're kind of in that death grip going down and, and whether it's cold or nerves or whatever, that's more work or burning too much energy. So we want a casual descent that keeps moving fast enough to get her to the bottom in time, but not so fast that we burn up energy that we don't want to waste. So we're estimating that at about 12 miles an hour. And as you can see, if you combine those, it puts us about a one hour lap time. Now, the way I did rest stops here, we're gonna take six full rest stops. We're gonna talk about micro segments in a minute, but actually 
We probably won't need all six. I'll explain why in a moment. But I wanted to make sure I built in our estimates and our projections enough true rest time. So you could calculate this. Like if it takes 18 laps, you could say five minutes for 18. So you could try to estimate your rest between laps. But Rebecca to, is taking on a pretty big challenge here. <laughs> we kind of had that discussion in the last couple of days, right? And the thing is, she isn't really going to have a lot of time to rest because um, we're going to have to really keep going and moving on pace to get her there. So we are looking at some good stops, but we're going to shorten. Remember, I gave advice last time in that your in-between segment, you know, your micro segments resting for 15 to 45 minutes. We're going to keep her rest in those time frames pretty short. And hey, Tim, can I add something here? Because this is really cool. I, this, today was the first day of me seeing this graph that he ran off the Everest calculator, which is really cool. And it's uh, a bit of a tactic that I've used in the field as well as average miles per hour. Like when I was racing Leadville or anything else, um, I knew the average miles per hour total that I wanted to hit. And so I, I, um, I program my Garmin so I can see that number. That's more valuable to me to see average miles per hour than to see my current speed, because then I know if I'm on track. So if we take this Everest calculator graph, you would, my actual miles per hour that I would shoot for in the field is going to be right in between that six and 12. So nine and a half or something is if I want to stay on track, that's the number I could use in the field to stay with this plan. Is that right? Absolutely. And that's going to be what we're going to target on our climbs. Um, we'll be able to, you know, we want an overall average of six miles an hour up, 12 miles an hour down. And if we do those things, all the other math will work out, right? Yeah. And it's the simplest, easiest number to track and focus on. And it's um, motivating for me. Like if I see I'm ahead, I'm like, oh, my average is pretty good. I'm doing all right. Like it's super motivating or, or I'll be like, oh, I need 0.1 more miles per hour you know it's not a big jump but you can use it incrementally like on the fly instead of being 14 hours in and realizing you're behind schedule you can kind of stay in tune with it in the moment yeah and it's great and that that is a great mental game too isn't it you're yeah. chasing that point one you're chasing that point one no that's and and hey i'm going 6.9 you know i could get a, to seven you always want to make sure you stay within the right range but what you're seeing here is a pretty good system of targeting. I have the link to it on the final slide, right? It'll give you some deeper insight. The first couple of ones, we wanted you to do your own planning and thinking. And here's a quick lesson why, right? Most of you won't run into this problem, but because it's a one in a thousand issue. But when we ran the calculator for Trail Creek Climb, it's saying the total gain is 1577. And the segment is actually saying 1430. So make sure you double check, right? In the end of the day, use the segment and your Garmin climbing uh, calculation, you know, as your uh, core marker. So the segment is, you know, and, and 99 times, I mean, I went and ran like 10 other climbs just to see if it, there was something, you know, and of course all other ones lined up perfectly. But just remember, double check once you do your planning against your segment and have your problem reconcile. I spent some time using other services like Ride with GPS and some of Rebecca's former climbs on Training Peaks to make sure I align and said, oh, which one of these are right and we know. And we we're actually talking about this before the <laughs> for the session. There's a pretty good chance she's actually gonna do 20 laps. So if you think 18.4 at 20 hours, that's why I'm keeping her rest time tight because this is a pretty big challenge on this gravel surface based on her pacing. So, you know, make he sure. Like, you me. I thought I had to do 18, then it was back to 20. I was like, oh, okay. But I mean, for me, I'm going to, I'm going to shoot for the higher number mentally and watch my Garmin and, and, you know, cause I don't want to be one foot short of 29. I don't want to be, you know, 28, 99 and like not get it done. <laughs> Yeah, agreed. So um, now let's just translate that into a plan. So basically what we did in our plan, here's our little, based on that number, a little micro segment plan. We need, you know, we're, we're looking at about 20 hours of ride time, just kind of rounding stuff. 
Now, in our micro segment, we know we have a 60 minute lap. So we're going to break this down into six times three laps per micro. So that's basically going to put her on the bike for about three continuous hours before she takes a longer break, that restoring break that we talked about. Now, the problem is she has it, if it's 18.4, she has an extra lap to make up. So when are you going to do that extra lap in which segment? Because six times three is 18. But according to the current calculations, she needs 18.4. So what I'm going to recommend to Rebecca is that she does the first micro segment is four laps. It is so much easier and better for you physically to get that extra lap <laughs> out of the way early when you're a little fresher and you've kind of, you know, um, a little more up for it, both physically and mentally, than trying to make that last micro segment the extra lap because that's where it just becomes kind of a a lot more mentally tougher. So we'll probably end up doing the first set of four and then five times three throughout the day. That absolutely guarantees us if these calculations are right, that she hits the numbers and she's good. One of the reasons Rebecca's a very good endurance athlete, as most of you guys know and would guess, right? So it might be better, it might keep her moving a little faster to do them in four hour segments, you know, right around four hours, three to four hours. You're kind of burning through all your fuel resources at this pace, probably at this pace, more like four hours for a trained athlete. But yet what's going to happen and that, you know, she needs to consider two different uh, things that are going to increase her fuel intake, her fuel needs, therefore can also and will also increase her fatigue. One is she's going downhill. And the downhill is a little rougher, right? You're on gravel. It's been recently graded. We're going to run some chatter. We're going to see some rain ruts, and we're going to see some challenges, right? That's going to be engaging on the downhill a lot of upper body. She's going to be using more. She's going to have more muscular engagement in the process than just a nice smooth road descent where maybe she's just swooping down and easy. That's going to take some, you know, more work in the physiological sense. She's going to burn more kilojoules of energy. Therefore, she's going to need a little more fuel and she's going to need a little more um, food, a little more, you know, I'm sorry, she's going to have a little more fatigue and she's going to need a little more food as fuel. And the reality is based on that, and she's going to be seeing some colder temperatures in the dark where she will be burning energy just staying warm. It's not best to try to push it out to the floor. There's no reason here to go over the top or to push it to the level. The, this is a challenge, not a world record attempt. The idea here is, can you complete it? She's better off setting it up in a way that suits her physiology. Good, steady pacing, stay on her, as she calls it, her all day pace, um, which truly is her all day pace. It's quite amazing. Um, fuel to support that all day pace. And there's no reason to push it to some extreme limit. Let's play it safe, particularly early. Because what's going to happen to her and, potential, and potentially happen to her and some of you is you might need to make up time in those last couple of hours, right? You might need to make up distance or climb or elevation, right? In those last couple of hours, you need the energy in the system to do it. So we're better off being patient early, ensuring the engine is well fueled and going on from there. Excuse me, I'll take a try. Yeah, and the point here is like more is not necessarily better. If like in the beginning, I'm like, I can do a, a, a you know, six lap micro segment and that'll be better and then i'll just be further ahead you actually are going to start to dig yourself into a hole and so the the point of this you might not feel like you need the breaks early on and even if they're short you know they might be five minutes uh, but you're using them as a restorative so you're getting in some different calories and you will need that you might not need them in that moment but you need them um, three quarters of the way through. And that's where it's kind of like a building block. So if you blow off your early nutrition or rest, you're going to pay for it down the road. So, so be disciplined there, even when you think you don't need it. It's hardest early on. And this is where a lot of people mess up in ultra endurance events is they go out, they go out pretty hot. They feel great for four, five, six hours, and they're just drink one water bottle or whatever, and then they pay for it um, hours later. And you see it in Leadville, it's classic. You see it every time. And so if you can be disciplined um, and, and start conservative, and then as you're feeling better, you're getting closer, start ramping it up 10%, 20, as you can towards the 
half and three quarters way, that's where you, you put your extra energy in, but be conservative in the beginning and you'll, you'll, you'll be happy for it later. Um, it, it will definitely pay off and pay dividends in your, your nutrition and rest. Absolutely. And that's why I'm recommending everybody breaks it down into these micro segments as milestones, right? So it's not just a milestone like, wow, I have to hit that. You also don't want to go crazy and exceed that either. It's all about finding that right pacing and rhythm that will give you event success. So that's a really great point, Rebecca. I mean, and, and you do, you get jazzed up early. So you, you're like, oh, I'm 10 minutes ahead. I'm going to try to make myself 20 minutes ahead and then 30 minutes ahead. And then before you know it, two hours later, you're, you're starting to blow up. You're starting to hit the wall. So use your segments, stay on pace, be disciplined. So within the micro segments, we have a lap strategy. We know she's going to be probably through the day ranging her climbs between 35 and 45 minutes and about a 20 minute descent. Um, nutrition wise, I want her taking in about 100 to 125 calories every 30 minutes. Um, the reality is I'm not a big fan of eating once an hour. I see that all the time in nutritional guidance, like eat this every hour and people mean I should eat on the hour. The reality is you're probably better off eating in kind of chunks, like every 30 minutes is pretty good. You can actually though go the reverse, like if you're eating a little bit every five minutes, that's, uh, not as efficient, believe it or not. Um, you're better off eating maybe every 20 or 30 minutes. So what I recommend to keep it simple, every 30 minutes, about 100 to 125 calories. Um, you want a high mixed carbs. And what I mean by mixed carbs, if you're using a drink mix or food, you, you, the, the more technical term is shorter long chain carbs, or you might know it as, as high and low glycemic carbs. Um, sugars versus maybe some starches or grains and things like that. There's different ways. Everybody has some pretty good awareness of that today, which is awesome. We've learned to understand carbs and how we burn and break down fuel better. So you're looking for about 25 to 40 grams of carbs an hour. It really depends on how hard you're going. You shouldn't have a lot of high intensity here. If we were going harder, you might say a little more calorie, a little more carbs as a part of that. But we're going to be ticking along at a pretty good pace, close enough, and you are burning a lot of carbs, but not like rocket fuel carbs. You're not, you don't have the engine revving super high. So just a good target, 25 to 40. Um, and it really depends on, on what you can digest, too. Always make sure, like we talked about in the second session, you've tested what you're eating and can digest it. You can take your calories and carbs as a blend of liquid and food, or you can do it all liquid if you have a reason. I've seen people who do that, even though it's not my favorite. I've seen people unfortunately do it all food. I really don't recommend that. You need liquids as part of digestion. So try to do, you know, I tend to generally be um, a fan of light carbs in a drink mix, more food in, uh, more of your carbs in your consumption, your, your, uh, food and eating your carbs and drinking your drink, but over longer events where consuming enough food and keeping the calories, I tend to come off that platform and say a good blend, a fair amount of carbs, an average amount of carbs that you know you can withstand, not too crazy heavy, but a fair amount of carbs that you know you can withstand in your drink mixed with good kind of solid foods. One of the things you want to make sure you're getting into your drink or your bar or as a pill, you know, they have electrolytes, tablets is electrolytes and BCAAs. They will both help you um, stay on top of your, your energy and your fuel gain. Electrolytes, as you know, will help you hold water, uh, you know, uh, will help your hydration is a better way to say it. You'll have, you know, you'll hydrate better. You have a better balance of hydration. And the BCAAs will give you a little more, uh, uh, muscular re restoration and keep you ticking along. Now, when Rebecca does stop in these in-between segments where we're looking to restore, I said for everybody 15 to 45 minutes, but we're going to keep her tight and keep her rolling along. We want to make sure we stay on schedule. Um, you know, the one of the things here is I have a broad range for uh, Rebecca because she really has learned what she needs. Like I find that athletes with experience in this, com hopefully most athletes eventually hits this experience, not everyone, they learn to do a really good job of listening to their body, um, you know, and they're listening to the message and they're listening to the demand, right? And that's my little 3L thing. 
Rebecca has a really good sense of that, you know, and I've already learned in the time that she knows. Not everybody has it, but the reality is for her, it's probably more of a range of things. So I'm saying somewhere between 100 to 300 calories, right? And it really probably depends on what she was eating and how well she was nailing her nutrition on each lap. And it really probably depends on what her body is telling her. If she's hungry, she already knows she's going to be smart enough to know it's already getting too late. I should have had more calories. Um, so she's going to stay on top of that, but she feels it pretty well. During these stops, I would really focus on complex carbs. So 55 to 70 percent. You still want a fair amount of those calories to be carbs, but I would avoid the high glycemic, the less complex carbs here. I wouldn't be looking at glucose, which is the highest <laughs> or sugars and stuff like that. You want a more complex blend here. You want things that are going to slow down, digest a little slower, hit your body a little slower. Um, you really don't want to kind of spike that insulin cycle and, and make things start happening there. Um, you can take in a decent blend of protein and fats here, right? But make sure it's food you know you can consume. Make sure it's um, food that you've tested in exercise environments before. This might not be the time to be stopping off at, you know, five guys burgers and bringing a couple of burgers and putting them in your back seat and eating that in between and be like, oh, later you're feeling that in your belly and you can't do it. If you know that bacon is a savory, tasty food and you want it and it's calorie dense, great. As long as you know you can then ride your bike and keep going after it. So make sure your foods are familiar and you know it. Um, and I think, and finally, and I put this in the general, Think that buffet of desire, right? You're going to have weird food cravings in that once you start getting over six to eight hours, watch what happens. You're going to be climbing. This always happens to me. Um, it was funny, Rebecca and, and, and I and Ali were working out the other day and we were on Zwift in New York and I'm like, man, I really want a hot dog. And I know they, bought, they both thought I was joking, but I was underfed, I was working hard, I'd been kind of tired, and I was like, you know what, I really do. My body was saying that's a protein that is absolutely not good for me, has probably very little nutritional value, but I was hungry for it. You really wanna solve those cravings here, so make sure the food that you bring in your aid station has a pretty good diversity within it. It has a pretty good um, range because, Man, if you're suddenly looking for that one thing and you want it, it's a, another uh, thing to have. And, uh, you know, another tip as far as in your lap strategy and in your, you know, as you're leaving your restore, you know, a great thing, I'm sure most of you might or might not know this. So carbs or sugars in your saliva, in your mouth, trigger um, carb or glucose or, or glycogen, it's glycogen in your muscles, it's glucose in your bud, release. So having like some hard candies, like if you're climbing, since you're not climbing super hard, you're not going to be breathing so heavy, you suck it in, you know, things like that. Don't be afraid because you might be like, man, I just want something different. I know when I used to do some longer events, I used to carry, it's so funny, I'm going to date myself, old fashioned root beer barrels because it had a bitey, not so sweet kind of flavor and it would break up drink mixes back in the day when they were really sugary, and really sweet but yet still keep carbs coming into my body. So overall, our strategy is going to, you know, reside in here. My final kind of comment of overall this, right, it's kind of like two ends of a pe pendulum. Don't overthink it so that you become so focused on your exact carb, your exact function, your exact, you know, every meal, every bit of food is exactly right. That gets too much mental stress. It gets too much time and energy in, in overthinking it. And then what it'll do is as soon as you get a little off that plan, you get, uh, you know, it creates a higher amount of strain within the system. Oh, I'm, I didn't eat or I missed that. Just have a good general plan, good general target, good general number. But on the other end of the extreme, and Rebecca said this is a great example, and it is the ultimate example because people do this all the time. Be attentive to your food. It's so easy to start knocking out your laps and falling behind and, oh, I grabbed the long bottle and this one had water and I forgot to eat my bar that lap. And suddenly you're, you're three feeds behind because you weren't attentive. Stay attentive to your food strategy. One of the things I highly recommend is have known points where you're going to eat or finish your bottle if you're taking fluid, uh, liquid calories. Have a, a rock halfway up your climb. 
maybe it's the top of your climb at the turnaround point. You put a foot down for one minute and eat a bar and then start descending while you're finishing your chew. Whatever it is, connect your attention, your food consumption strategy with your lap strategy. It's at the midpoint, it's at the top, it's at this rock, it's at that, my favorite mailbox, <laughs> whatever works for you, right? But make it so it becomes part of the habit. You're eating when you see that rock. That will also help you convince yourself to eat. You might not be fully hungry at that point yet, but you're gonna go and say, your brain's gonna tell you, you're gonna help convince your brain, I need to eat now, that's my point, that's my signal, and it'll help keep your attention. So don't overthink, but be attentive. I, I like that idea of having triggers that you if you visually see like, oh, I cross at that tree there, I'm going to eat and drink because it, it takes the guesswork out of it and it reminds you, you know, in venture racing, we used to set on our watches like every 30 minutes, a little beep your client, a little beep, which is totally annoying, um, but it made everybody hear the beep. You'd be like, oh, I got to drink something. Um, otherwise, you could go hours and just and just forget. And I remember one race in New Zealand, I was really struggling to stay hydrated. And so I played this game where I told myself every time I stepped over water or because there were tons of creeks, it was a mountainous place. And so anytime I walked through water, I had to drink water. <laughs> and I found I, it like made me drink because I had a different sort of a trigger instead of just, oh, I know I'm supposed to do it. Because then what you do, you're like, I know I need to drink. And then you look at your water bottle, like, I should drink, I should drink, I should drink. And you're like, I'll do it later. I should drink. I'll do it later. And you and you just don't do it. And so having the discipline to have markers on your course is a really, a really good strategy that works. I also, if I'm going to reach for my water bottle, this is an efficiency thing. If I'm going to take my hand off my bar, use the energy to reach down and grab my bottle, I don't just take one drink. I take two drinks. Because it's like one motion, two drinks, and so it's like killing two birds with one stone. And it's kind of silly, but I play games like that for efficiency to, one, make sure I keep doing it, but to also not keep reaching down for my water bottle five million times. And if I'm really going for it, I take three drinks. <laughs> That's awesome. No, great, great ad. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Rebecca, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay, this is um this is the suffer face. Um, this happens to be a, a ride I did in Arkansas, and I think you guys can see how I'm feeling just from the look on my face. Um, you're gonna feel this way this weekend, um, and you might be saying bad words, you might be cursing me, you might be cursing Tim. Um, you're definitely gonna be you're gonna be on a roller coaster ride because that's what endurance events are. You're gonna have some some of the time you're gonna be like, I could do this forever. I could do three Everests. And then half an hour later, you might be, you know, with your tongue on the dirt, um, wondering what happened. Um, absolutely, it's a roller coaster ride. And um, a friend of mine that I have down here uh, told me something very early into my adventure racing days is that no matter how good or bad you feel, it won't last. And I use, I've used that for 30 years. So if I'm feeling really good. I don't get cocky about it. I'm still stay on my hydration, stay disciplined. And if I'm feeling really bad, it's the same strategy. Like I know I'll come out of it. I just got to get through it. Take a little longer rest, walk your bike, do whatever you need to do, but realize that, you know, what comes up comes down and what goes down comes up. Um, and, and you've got to just tell yourself that no matter how good or bad you feel, um, it won't last. And so controlling the controllables, we've talked a lot about it, but um, it's up to you to have the nutrition discipline. And I gave you a few tips like, you know, one water bottle per hour, two to 300 calories per hour. That's my go-to. But then, yeah, I'm planning in between. Grab my water bottle once, drink twice. Um, you know, I keep my food wrappers, empty wrappers in my left side and full food in my right side. So I can always reach back and, and feel how much food I have. So think about your efficiencies and every movement that you do um, is going to add up and burn calories and use energy. So it's almost like um, you want to put only the energy into your forward motion and not into anything else. Um, and the nutrition discipline is the number one thing. If you nail that, you'll, you'll do well. Um, Pacing, consistency is king. We already talked about that of, of starting conservative and then finishing fast. I, and I think I told you uh, my one of my favorite comebacks is someone at the finish line of the Leadville Trail 100. 
Um, you know, historically in my racing, I'm always off the back at, at the beginning of the ride, even in the races that I've won. Um, and this guy said to me at the finish line one time, he's like, why do you start so slowly? And I had finished in front of him. Um, and my response was, well, why do you finish so slowly? And so it, it matters only when you finish. So take your time in the beginning, um, be conservative, go, you know, pull it back 80%. You know, you're at the 80% level, definitely not 100%. Um, and slowly add, um, if you're feeling really great, half and three quarters of the way through. Um, I have another little strategy that's going easy on the hard and hard on the easy. And this is another Leadville strategy, you know, climbing your hill um, and, and throwing down, you know, 100 watts more power or just really matching the pedals to get up to the top of the hill might gain you two minutes you know, um, or a minute or the, the sort of expenditure to what you get back on the hard parts of, of an endeavor, which is the climbing on this, the extra energy there doesn't pay the gains that you would get in being smoother on the downhill, minimizing your rest stops, being really efficient in the aid station. You're going to gain exponentially more time in the easy parts of your challenge than by climbing a lot harder every lap. And so I try to remember that by go easy on the hard and hard on the easy. So as you're going uphill, you are conserving, you're being consistent, you're not burning a lot of matches. Um, and then when you can, you're you know gliding really getting great on the descent, being efficient, and you're you're rocking through your aid stations and your turnarounds. Um, and then it's also like we're just talking about, it's not just about the ride time, the, the organization and the work that you do leading up to packing your aid station and getting ready, um, that is going to pay dividends as well. And I also, um, you know, while I'm climbing up to my aid station or I'm, I'm thinking about it ahead of time, I'm like, okay, I want to get that one water bottle. I want to change my headlamp battery and I want to take some electrolytes. Like I make a plan before I get there so that when I'm there, because the clock doesn't stop, I know, okay, I was gonna do these three things. Um, so there is a lot, there's a big mental game. And so if you can stay mentally focused, um, you're gonna do really well. And that's the second part of this slide. Um, when the body is tired, that's where the mind takes over. And that's where, that's really where the magic happens. And I said earlier in this slide, in this, this talk, the reason I do ultra endurance events and is and go into these pain cave types of places um, is because that's where you really find out what you're made of. And that's where the really cool stuff happens. Um, you know, you're going to be thinking about things you've never thought about. You're going to be loving that song that's on, on, you know, your phone. You're going to be solving the problems of the world. I guarantee it. Um, you're going to have a really cool meditative endurance experience because um, when your body is physically tired, you really do unleash your mind. And so enjoy that. Um, and realize that your mind is either your biggest enemy or it's your biggest asset. And you're going to ride that roller coaster ride, but, um, but really, you know, your body's going to be tired. Your legs are going to be dead. Absolutely. I did two laps on my hill that I'm supposed to do 20 laps of this weekend, and I was tired after two laps. My legs were fatigued, and I was like, uh oh. Um, but realize there's a lot more in there than, than you think. And that's the cool thing about something stepping outside your comfort zone like you're going to do this weekend, um, you're going to find a different part of yourself. And so, you know, take solace in the fact of your why, why you're here, why you signed up for it. And, and when your body's physically tired, that's where your mind needs to be the strongest. Um, another adventure racing, another adventure racing tip that a friend gave me on my very first eco challenge years ago in Australia, he said to me, you know, um, you can run across the hot coals or you can walk across the hot coals. So it's going to hurt. This weekend's going to hurt. It's going to be hard. Um, and so you might as well get through it efficiency, efficiently, as quickly as possible, um, instead of really prolonging it, staying in this pain cave longer than you need to stay. Um, so be efficient and realize the celebration, you know, is is on the other side of it. And so um, I, I have this envision of the gurus who are like, you know, running across the hot coals and and it is going to hurt so i'm not going to tell you it doesn't um but there are definitely gifts waiting for you along the way that that you might 
might not know are there. And so, um, but the walking versus the running, you might as well uh, be efficient and, and get to your finish line as quickly and efficient, as efficiently as you can. Um, and then we've already talked about, um, you know, physical pain really is a teacher and it's a cool place to go. Not everybody can go and do something like this. Not everybody chooses to, uh, but not everybody's going to get to discover, you know, what you're going on a personal journey, really a vision quest this weekend. Um, and I don't mean to like get too deep or anything, but that is really what's going to happen. So enjoy it, relish in it, relish in the fact that you are able to go out and ride and run and do your bike we're lucky. Um, and even if you're doing it indoors and, and really ultimately when it's terrible and you want to quit, go back to your why and why did you sign up for this in the first place? And, um, I would love for you guys to report back with your whys, um, on Monday after midnight. <laughs> All right. That's it for my motivation, my stoke. <laughs> All right. Well, let's open it up to uh, some Q&A now. I think that's uh, some really good points. I saw a fair amount of questions coming in. Um, let's see if I can just uh, put this on my main screen here so I can actually read them. The old eyes are getting older. Okay, going from older, the original questions to the newest ones. So here we go. This is for you, Rebecca. Rain is in the forecast for us. Any tips for riding 12 hours in the rain? question mark anything to do differently than as if than if it was dry yeah absolutely um and those are really good questions uh you realize um you know and this is for anyone whether it's raining or not um you're going to get really hot on the uphill and you're going to get cold on the downhill um so i am going to be riding with a rain jacket as well but even if i'm chilled at the bottom of the climb i'm going to take that jacket off because you also think about if you're soaking yourself from the inside, you may be protecting yourself from the elements on the outside, but often um, your sweat can soak you from the inside. So maybe you're gonna wear climbing, it's raining, maybe you're wearing actually just a, a wind shell or, or something like that, and then a true waterproof um, kit on the way down. I would have three or four changes of clothes because if you do really get chilled to the bone, there's nothing better than putting on a dry chamois, um, also for you know chafing and stuff like that, but putting on a dry kit. I'm a really big fan of wool in, in wet temperatures because it stays warm when it's wet. And so I'll be wearing wool base layers, potentially a wool jersey. Um, so, those are some of my rain tips. Something that I really like this, again, this comes back from adventure racing days and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it with me is a plastic uh, shower cap from, you know, a one star hotel um, and surgical gloves. And those work as really beautiful uh, and plastic bags. So really great vapor barrier liners that are super, super light. Um, I find sometimes the best booties in the world or the best big, you know, rain gloves in the world um, don't do as well as just some cheap plastic. And so this is always in my ride kit uh, for adventuring. And I'll put the shower cap underneath my helmet. Um, you can even pull it over your ears. Uh, plastic uh, or surgical gloves go underneath your riding gloves or and Ziploc bags inside your shoes. And if you, I would have a stash of those because if you really are cold, what that does, that traps your body moisture right inside. You're going to be sweaty on the inside of it, um, but you'll be warm. And that's a, that's a really good emergency tip that works. You know, it's not a long term uh, uh, sort of um, solution. I'd say obviously bring your Gore-Tex, bring all that good stuff. Um, but for me, if my hands and my feet and my head are insulated, then I feel like a lot of times I'm generating enough body heat with the movement um, in my core and all that kind of stuff. So, but have a variety of layers and, and try them out. And I would say you're gonna have to take it on, put it off, take it on, put it off um, from your climb to your descent. Yep, great answer. Okay, next question for you. You talk about nervous before a big event like this. Any tip, tips on dealing with it? It affects my sleep and my ability to eat and my mood starting even now. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's that's uh, one thing to recognize is that nerves are in what people might call fear. That's the same emotion as excitement. So so I try to twist it when I stand on the tar a start line. If I'm nervous, 
Um, it's actually excitement and that means you care. It means you're, you're signing up for something cool. And if you break down, what are you nervous about? If you're nervous about, oh, you know, I don't, I don't know if my equipment's the right equipment. Well, you can deal with that. Or I don't know what I'm going to eat. Well, you can deal with that. If you're just nervous about, oh, I don't know if I can do it, which I am. Um, then the same thing, you control your pacing, you break it into small chunks and realize that, you know, ultimately what is the, what are you truly nervous about? If you, if you fail and you climb half of an Everest, you know, is that such a bad thing? And so if I, if, if I can break down, are my fears, um, and nervousness, is it something I can tr control? Is it a legitimate concern? Um, and if not, I think sometimes just changing that dialogue in, in my head helps me think about it. And I spend a lot of time tinkering with my gear and that does help me sleep at night. Um, you know, you can obviously try meditation or relaxation or breathing or some of those things. But I find really if I mentally break down what is causing that fear, um, and try to address it, that often helps. And really then ultimately, like, what's the worst thing that could happen? you don't complete the challenge. We're still going to love you. It's still going to be okay. You're still going to get an awesome uh, weekend of training in. Agreed. Excellent. All right. Next question. Aid station on the top or the bottom of the climb? Mm, you know, a bunch of people are doing, I'm, I'm going to do the top. Um, I think <laughs> I keep going back and forth. Um, and the reason I think that I'm going to do the top is that um, I want to be able to put um, some of my more solid calories in my mouth and into my body at the top of the climb so that I'm digesting it as I'm going down. Um, I won't really be able to take my hands off the handlebars because I have a technical descent. And so I'm going to stop at my aid station, stuff a couple of things in my mouth, and then be um, be sort of chewing them as I'm, as I'm going down the hill. Um, so I'm going to put my aid station at the top, um, but my friend is putting hers at the bottom. So I, I really think it's personal preference. It also depends on too, what's the safest spot um, for your for your hill and what is out of traffic or out of the way or is going to be reasonable you know, for you to get to. I, I don't think there's one that's better or worse than the other. I think it's kind of a personal decision based on on how you want to set it up. Tim, do you have any anything to add? No, I think it's a. Tr I think you need to pay attention to your environment. I mean, I said no, and then I add something right now. <laughs> yes, um, I think you should pay attention to your environment and look at the trade-offs. Right, everything is a cost-benefit. If you're in a situation where you need to be descending with heavier jackets more than half the day, let's just more than half the 24 hours, you might want to consider, you know, the bottom a little more weighty because then you can drop you know, um, some, it's easier to drop a jacket, you know, or something at the bottom or versus the top or the top versus the bottom, depending on that environment. So it's like one of the things that Rebecca just said that raised my eyebrow was like, well, she has, she's going to be on top and her friends down below. So can you, you know, throw stuff in a common area? So it's like, you know, one of the things I've seen people do is to be able to put a, an aid station at the bottom and have some supplies up top. So there are some other answers that are kind of outside the box. If you're really suffering from temperature or, you know, uh, a person asked us before about rain and how you need to get through that, you can come up with some creative solutions. In the end of the day, I like on top in that sense because you can, you, you get that couple of seconds of rest and recovery after work like meaning after you've climbed all the work, you can get fuel immediately into your body while you've been at a higher intensity and then get the digestion and recovery rolling as you're descending down. But, yeah. you know, environmentally can affect that. You might find a better reason to be on the bottom. It depends what you're carrying and how many clothes and what you might need. You made a good point though. You could have a, like a little mini satellite, like just a little cooler with some water bottles and yeah. maybe one extra jacket on the bottom or on the top. So you could have like, if the, if the situation allows for it, um, you could have a little satellite station. And, you know, honestly, if you've been sheltering in place with a loved one or a roommate or whatever, you know, by all means, bring somebody out there that you safely can be in contact with. Um, as an aid station manager and support crew, there, there's nothing that says you can't have somebody safely there, they're helping you one for moral support, but also um, kind of managing your little aid station setup. 
Yeah. So I'm going to ask the new question, two, next two questions in combo. So question one is what screens and what data fields do you have on your Garmin? Mm -hmm. But then question number two is, and will you hit lap button for each climb descent or just let it go? And then sort of in there, so question number three, Kate, you definitely are, are the question leader. So the third part of that question is, will you stop your Garmin for the 15 minute rest stop or let it run? Okay, so I'll answer the last question first. I'm gonna let my thing run the whole time because that's how it works. Um, you aren't really supposed to stop it. Your cumulative time is your cumulative time. And so that's what we've been talking about this whole time by being efficient in your rest stops and all that is it's from start to finish. So you shouldn't be stopping your Garmin or you shouldn't have it on uh, the mode where where if you aren't moving, it stops. I forget what that's called. Um, so it needs to be running continuously, recording your effort. So that those are the official rules, you know, of the Eversting and the leaderboard. And I didn't make up those rules. Um, but yeah, I'll I'll start it. I'll leave it running the whole time. Um, I won't do the lap button just because I don't operate that way. I'm looking at this as one big thing, even though I'm going to break it into micro segments of, of three or four laps at a time. Um, what I will have on my screen, I already talked about it. I, I always have average miles per hour on the screen because that's my goal. And that is the, the one metric that is really going to help me know if I'm going to finish in my desired time or if I'm a little behind or if I'm a little ahead. So I know that magic number of my average miles per hour that I need to hit my goal. So I have that up. Um, I, I, well, I usually have two screens. I have my riding screen. Um, and then the second screen is like, oh, it's kind of interesting screen. So like my Watts and those things are going to be on screen number two um, because I don't want to dictate my effort um necessarily based on my power meter number and that's just me as an athlete i feel like i know myself well enough but i also be like kind of interesting like oh we said i should hit 100 and whatever watts you know so i might want to look over at it but i don't want to constantly be staring at it and have it sort of mentally i don't want my front screen to be something that's actually going to bring me down and be like oh my god like I'm sucking right now. My heart rate's too high. My watts are too low. Um, but I have them if I want to look over at them. They're just not staring me in the face the whole time. So what is staring me in the face is elapsed time, um, average miles per hour, super important distance. I really like that. Um, my battery life I put on the front screen for something like this because I want to know if I'm getting low. I don't want to be caught off guard by that. Um, let's see what else. Those are going to be the main things. Um, but then, yeah, I have that hidden screen that's got all this other cool stuff, maybe sunrise, sunset. Those are kind of some interesting things when you're when you're doing um, long events, because then you can plan, oh, next lap, I've got to put my lights on, you know, but you might just know where you live that sunset is at whatever time. You might not need those things. I, I would say I like my front screen to be pretty minimal. Like I said, I don't want it to be a distraction. Um, and, and I can check in with it. I also, again, reminder, we talked about this in the first webinar, I think, put your Garmin on battery save mode, turn your backlight way down, make sure that you're really maximizing your battery life um, so that you don't lose credit for this three quarters of the way, three quarters of the way through. So that's why I have that battery, um, that battery life number up there as well, so that I'm heads up of like, oh, I'm down to 20%. I better plug in for a little bit. Great Tim, answer. would you add anything else? No, I think that's a great answer. I think one of the things, definitely avoid focusing on the in the moment information, right? This is an event that's really about a larger accomplishment, about accumulating something. Um, I am, you know, uh, I'm not a big believer of, of having even power on your screen in races because it, it talks you out of stuff. Don't use data to talk you out of stuff. You know, make sure that you're doing things that are supporting your overarching goal. You know, I think your numbers and your answer was dead bang on, so great answer. All right, next question. I saw a Red Bull drink in your nutrition kit last week. When and why do you use that? Question mark. Is it strictly calorie replacement? Question mark. Um, yeah, Red Bull is definitely a part of my, uh, 
I, I would say nutri not it's part of my uh, food and drink intake. Um, it is not, I don't calculate it in the calories. Um, you know, that is calculated on goo and roctane and rice cakes. Um, really Red Bull for me, it's, it, it wakes me up. And when I'm like sort of, you know, having the sleepies in the middle of the night or just kind of dragging a lot of times just in, in regular, you know, if I'm doing an afternoon workout, I'll have a Red Bull. And so for me, it really is, um, is a wake up and attention and, and kind of mental focus, um, when I'm, when I'm dragging. And I will um, often mix uh, the one way that I like to consume Red Bull is I'll put it in a water bottle with um, half water and then the can of Red Bull. And so that it's it's just a little easier to drink that way on the bike. I don't want to carry a can with me or anything like that. So, so yeah, it's definitely, you know, I save it for when I really need it. And it's, you know, if anyone who's like falling asleep at the wheel, I mean, you know that feeling when you're just really like you've got the nutrition in and that, but you're just tired. And that's when I'll, that's when I'll drink Red Bull. So, you know, I'll kind of pace it out. I'm not drinking them every lap for sure. Um, but I estimate probably, you know, maybe three or four during the course of the 20, 20 hour excursion. Good answer. All right. Here comes the next one. Does calorie, calorie burn rate stay the same through the ride or does burn rate increase assuming one maintains that all day pace? That's you, coach. You have to answer that. <laughs> yeah. So um, your calorie rate, you have to define what you're saying, but the answer is it stays the same. So, and I know, Kate, you train with power. You have to think about that a watt and a calorie are basically the same thing. It's a, a watt is a kilojoule per second of energy. So the reality is if your watts how hard times how fast you're pedaling stay the same, your calorie rate will stay the same. Um, now, the reality probably would be to some degree, right? You're fading off, maybe you're losing, your, if your power is going down, you're fading and losing some watts, then your calorie rate would actually go down based off that. Now you do lose a little bit of efficiency and efficiency is the ability to turn the fuel that you've taken in into uh, moving the bike forward. And you and I have actually had this discussion before, you're about 22, 23% efficient. So it's really a one-to-one -one rate. So it'll generally stay the same. Um, the thing that you really need to be careful about that people make or, or get a different feeling is if you're eating the wrong food and you're having one, a bad macronutrient mix, or two, you are not digesting, you've gotten yourself into some GI issues, that's where you can feel like you're, you're beginning to really lose energy, fade, burning more energy. That's often, those feelings that you can get are often more a, a process of the content of the nutrition more specifically than a change in calorie uptake. Yeah, and, and when I get, if I get into those GI issues, I find just plain water, little, little sips of plain water very frequently um, often helps me get out of it. And then mixing up oftentimes going from sweet to savory or the other way around, I'm changing, changing the mix up a little bit, but, but water often will flush, help flush um, what's going on in your gut and bringing it down bringing your effort down one or two percent to allow that digestion to happen and take place and clear that's a great point it's a great way you've got to clear it it's really the only answer of what's going to make it better all right so this next two questions i'm going to combine so 2.5 grams of bcaas per bottle and i have 100 calories plus bcaas in my drink mix uh, wait, I lost my courser for a second. <laughs> I have 100 calories of BCAs in my drink mix, was drinking it over the course of 30 minutes, using a gel for the next 30 minutes. You just recommended getting all 100 calories in 20 minutes. How can I do that with a lot of drink all at once? All right, so let's, I, I can tackle the first one. The 2.5 grams of BCAs is the typical recommendation. You might 
I have found it it works better to have a little more, a little less. You know, nutrition really can be um, something a little more customized, but that's always a good starting point. Um, Michelle, your question about the calories. Um, you want to be taking in a total of, you know, re depending on your size and, and your general how hard you're going, you probably, you know, want about 200 calories an hour, 250 calories an hour um, for this type of an intensity event, because you're also going to be able to restore and eat a little extra in between. Um, if you are capable of consuming a little more, I'd err on the high side, but that might be more food than you can consume. Now, how you spread that out that really gets back to the point of your question. What if you drank you had half a bottle and one piece of food for the first 30 minutes, then half a bottle and the second piece of food for 30 minutes? Just make the end numbers add up in a place that you're comfortable with. Um, I'd be cautious about, I think the last part of your question is how can I do that with a lot of drink all at once? That's sometimes the limitation of drinking all your calories or having a drink mix that's super high in calories, you get trapped in that mix, right? You have to take a lot of that drink in to get the calories into you. It's almost easier if you have a food option. So you wanna be climbing light here. So maybe you reduce the amount of calories in the bottle by half and carry one bottle. If the math, I'm not doing math, but I think you get my point. Or carry one bottle of drink mix at your 100 calories and one bottle of water each half full and share them on the way up. So you have some options based on the way you drink it, but I would balance it better that way. I think that's the question you're asking and I hopefully I answered it. Yeah, I mean, these are these are super good questions and I said it in the beginning, all of my A plan that is like my bottle of Roctane and you know, this piece of food, that's my A plan that I'll I'll, you know, hopefully do every lap but then i'm also going to have b and c plans you know in the the background so that if i'm just not feeling that mix or that thing um i can grab something differently at the top so as you're as you're nearing your aid station really evaluate like am i feeling good is that is that going down well or do i feel like i'm really forcing it um and if you if you need to make a change and you know every third lap you're doing something different or every other lap you're doing something different um the the variety might be really nice you know you might not do exactly the same thing every lap um and it also might be kind of fun to like look forward to having having something different on the next lap i think that's a great point rebecca and just to, to harp on that you guys and I, I think michelle i hope i answered your question but this goes to the point of be careful about you know being having too much stress too much of a plan being trying to be too precise with that nutrition approach right if you're going to burn a lot of calories all day long most of you depending on your challenge are going to burn i don't know 5000 to 7500 calories depending on size this and that right you, you you're going to go through a lot of 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 food a lot of calorie a lot of fat have a little you know you don't have to be super disciplined you will be more successful if you take a calorie first, macronutrient second, and then the supplements, the BCAAs, the, 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 the electrolytes and things like that third, right? But if you had to put them in like a food pyramid, <laughs> like what's more important to your success, generally just get the calories in, have them in a good, is it 50% carbs in the first, you know, restore and then 70% later, don't get caught up in that over, over precision. Get in the food, the place that you're gonna bonk, right? If you have the right foods in your car, again, if you said, I'm I'm gonna only, you know, I'm, I'm gonna fill my pockets with steak and all I'm gonna eat is steak for 24 hours, yeah, well, then you, you you're not gonna make it work. But if you have a good mix of food, a good healthy mix of carbs, all the things we're talking about, the thing that's going to stop you from success is not whether you are 55% carbs or 65% carbs. The thing that's going to stop you from success is, did I keep eating every hour? Did I hit my lap goals for calorie and food? And did I restore in between? Not the exact precision of the breakdown. It's the overarching, it's the big picture attentiveness that will keep you on the track. I will say, and Rebecca hinted it before, and I couldn't agree more. The number one people, number one reason people fail in challenges like this is not their fitness; it's their nutrition. Either they get 
you know, hyper precise and too much stress and strain, or they lose attention. Just eat, get the calories in, have a good mix of foods, listen to your body to tweak and adjust your strategy, and you'll be okay. Um, don't panic and eat too much. Don't become unintentive and eat too little, and you will have success. All right, next question. Do you mount your phone to the bars along with your Garmin in light? And that's our last question, by the way. Yeah, um, sometimes, yes and no. Um, and I was kind of thinking about um, this, for this challenge, um, I, I think I am gonna mount my phone to my bars because I predict um, changing jackets, putting jackets on a lot and, and things like that. Um, and I, I have a mount that I really like, it's called the quad lock that's really secure with the phone. Um, and I mount, I'm mounting it not because I wanna look at a bunch of phone statistics or check my email or text or anything like that. Um, I'm mounting it there because I probably wanna take some pictures. Um, and so for me, it's a little bit of a different purpose. So I may mount it on the bar. I also have Revelate Designs, um, some little small uh, bags, that frame bags. So I also might put, put my phone in one of those. W whatever it is, make sure it's secure. You're not gonna lose it. Um, I'm not gonna run Strava as a backup on my phone because I wanna um, keep phone battery. Um, where, where I am, you know, my phone is my safety net. Um, and there's only a couple of spots on the time where on the climb where I get cell reception. And so, um, you know, really I want my phone to be there in case something happens and I need to call somebody. Um, but that's just personal preference. Whatever you're going to try for the weekend, make sure you try it out ahead of time. Make sure it's secure. Make sure it's not in the way. Make sure you like it. Um, but yeah, there's not one one way to do it. It it really depends on on how you're using your phone and if you want to have easy access to it. If you're if you're going to be using your phone for your navigation and all that, and you want to you're touching it and and want it, then I'd say yeah, you should have it on your bar so that it's accessible and it's ready there for you, and you don't have to dig into a pocket or or drop it or or whatever. Great answer. Yeah. Um, Awesome, that concludes our questions. Uh, we did get a, a huge thank you from Michelle. Michelle, thank you for being on, but we don't have, and from Kate. So we don't, we do not have any other questions. So I think we can go ahead and wrap it up. Thanks yeah. everybody for being. It's, uh, these are great questions, it's awesome. Um, good job being on here and doing your preparation and your education. It's, it's gonna pay dividends. You guys are gonna do great. It's a lot of the same regular folks who are tuning in here, which is awesome. Um, we do have on the screen, just a little reminder, make sure you know your Garmin is connected to Strava. Make sure you've looked at the rules and you understand how to upload. Make sure you've joined the Strava club, run or bike, so that you can upload your results. Um, I don't want you guys to go through all this and crush it and have an awesome weekend and just have some little technology detail or some little oversight. Um, I'm ruining it for you. So, so make sure you go through that checklist of making sure you're, you're kind of read the rules, you know what's gonna happen, you know how you're gonna do your climb, you know how many times you're gonna do it, and then you just go out and ride. So we put a few links down there. Um, the website, rebeccasgiddyupchallenge.com also has frequently asked questions and some other resources, all the webinars. Um, so yeah, make sure, use this taper time um, to make sure you've got your equipment all dialed and, and that you're, you're right on track for the weekend. And most of all, please be sure to share your experience. I wanna hear about it. We're gonna find some way to have like a, a uh, you know, closing party or something um, when this is all done and check in with everybody. And uh, and really, I want to thank Tim for being part of these webinars of Science and Stoke and bringing the science to it all. Um, and, and then thank you guys for being part of this. It wouldn't be happening if it was just, uh, it was just me going and, and climbing this hill by myself. It'd be pretty boring. Um, and we wouldn't be raising all of these amazing funds for COVID relief. So, um, Tim, do you have anything to add to close it Simple. out? Yeah, I just wanted to say good luck to everyone. I, I, I think it's great. I think it's part of something that that really brings the endurance uh, athlete community together. We definitely respond to challenges. 
And I think you uh, being a leader and, and showing a great way to kind of fight the big challenge here that we're all facing with COVID and yet stay true to the culture and the things that motivate us, the individual challenge of achieving something great. So for everybody who's been on, best of luck, you know, use the lessons we've learned, stay confident in yourself and your ability, and you'll do great. So enjoy it, absorb it, let us know your experience, and we wish you the best of luck. Thanks, everyone. Giddy up. Giddy up. Bye now. <laughs> <laughs>